Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it is one minute after five o'clock. Uh, while few people are still joining us, uh, I still don't want to lose our precious time. Uh, wish you a good afternoon. Uh, warm welcome uh, from Berlin on behalf of the Heinrich Böll Foundation uh, to our uh, virtual roundtable, European-Ukrainian virtual roundtable on energy transition. Uh, today uh, on the topic of the current and future role of nuclear power in Ukraine. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here. Um, my name is Robert Sperfeld. I'm uh, the program officer for East and Southeast Europe at the Heinrich Böll Foundation's head office in Berlin. Um, this is uh, the third edition of uh, this roundtable format. In the first two discussions, we addressed more specifically the situation on, in, the, in the reform process of the energy uh, of the electricity market and the conditions for the renewable sector in the second edition. And um, uh, this time, we have chosen the nuclear sector as our topic. And uh, one and perhaps the main reason uh, for choosing it was the recent announcement by President Zelensky to restart the construction of two nuclear uh, reactor blocks in Khmelnytsky. Um, yeah, as Heinrich Böll Foundation, we uh, want to bring forward the debate on the transition towards a just and decarbonized design of the economy. So we want to offer platforms for constructive dialogue on how to cope with uh, related social, economic, and political challenges. Uh, looking particularly to Ukraine, uh, precisely this debate is a major focus of our activities. And uh, one part of it is also the exchange with European stakeholders. Uh, uh, this is why we are hosting this uh, series of events. Uh, as most of you know, uh, there are many links, um, legislative, political, uh, bilateral, multilateral cooperation on um, energy sector reform. Um, I will leave all further introductions to the topic uh, and with regard to our speakers, to my colleague Oksana Alieva, our uh, energy program coordinator in our Kiev office. Uh, she will moderate the discussion. But before handing over to her, I have very few technical remarks. Uh, first, as uh, this is an expert roundtable and we are not too many participants, everyone uh, can use the chat function, the chat room um, that you can open in the bottom bar of your Zoom window. And um, after the first round of discussion among the panelists, uh, you can then also pose a question to the panelists or a comment. Um, please use the, the blue hand function in Zoom for it. You will find it when you open the participants bar, um, click on the participants button in, on the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, second is that you should be aware that we are recording uh, this event. So um, in case you want to ask a question, you, you would be recorded. Um, last not least, um, yeah, we, uh, we would like you to uh, we would like to ask you to fill in uh, a short um, survey uh, on feedback to this event and we will post a link to this survey um, in the chat then towards the end of the discussion um, yeah so this is it from from my side um, I'm curious to learn more from our distinguished speakers this afternoon and I'm handing over to Oksana. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today and uh, finding time to uh, be with us to discuss such an issue as the future of uh, nuclear sector in Ukraine. First of all, let me to present our prominent panelists. 
Uh, today with us are Natalia Rybalka, who is Deputy Director of Directorate for Development of Nuclear Energy of the Ministry of Energy of Ukraine. Also, we have uh, Alexandra Zaika, uh, who is energy policy expert from the environmental NGO EcoAction. We have Mr. Massimo Gariba, who is Deputy Director General at Directorate General for Energy, and his group is coordinating Euroatom. Uh, and we have Mr. Anthony Frogot, who is Senior Research Fellow at Gatham House, and he is co author of the World Nuclear Industry Status Report. So we will start with the introduction statements from our panelists. And uh, we hope that this part will not last longer than half of an hour. And after it, we will pass to the questions and answers session. And as Robert just mentioned, it is very important for us to have your input in today's discussion. So we really welcome and will appreciate if you have questions to the panelists, to the speakers, or you wanted to comment something. So we really encourage you to do so. And uh, yep, why we are here? Because the recent announcement by the Ukrainian President Zelensky uh, on decision to complete the construction of two additional reactor blocks at Khmelnytsky nuclear power plant has attracted again new attention to the perspective of what is the future for the nuclear sector in Ukraine. We know that uh, uh, those uh, existing units uh, at the four nuclear stations in Ukraine uh, are almost all outdated. So uh, the major part of them have already expired the extended lifetime and we will know more about the situation in general uh, afterwards from uh, the representatives of the Ministry of Energy. But what uh, we also would like to stress today on, this is not only the uh, real possibility of the uh, finishing uh, construction at the sorted force units at Khmelnytsky nuclear power station that was started uh, in, um, in the middle of 80s of previous century. But to talk in more general on the uh, perspectives of future in Ukraine, because uh, it is not usually uh, discussed at the political level in Ukraine at the moment, uh, neither within the country, no, uh, when we come to international relations or to bilateral uh, communication with the European Union. Uh, because it is uh, something very complicated to uh, decide at the moment, and we really uh, understand this, that if we discuss the future of the nuclear energy, we can't talk about phasing uh, out all of the nuclear sector in just a few years. But we need to start the process with the overall uh, vision where we want to see uh, the role of the nuclear sector in the future energy balance of Ukraine. But to do so, for sure, we need, to, for all of us, we need to know better what is the current state of affairs and what role nuclear sector plays in, uh, in the Ukrainian energy, uh, particularly power market and in the energy balance uh, in general. And thus, I'm inviting to the uh, uh, first input speech, Mrs. Natalia Rybalka, who is Deputy Director of Directorate of Development of Nuclear Energy and Nuclear Industry of the Ministry uh, of Energy of Ukraine. So please, uh, Natalia, uh, tell us about what is the current situation with the nuclear sector in Ukraine and what are those policy measures that are already in place? Okay, do I, I'm here? Yes, we hear yes. you and I see your presentation. Just please start from the very beginning and we are very okay. curious to listen. Okay, I will give just a very short overview 
I will try to be short uh, of the nuclear energy sector in Ukraine. Uh, the main nuclear installation in Ukraine, uh, maybe you know, they consist of uh, 50 nuclear power units at four MPP sites. The overall The overall uh, capacity, installed capacity, is uh, 13 and uh, 385 gigawatt. Percentage uh, in the share uh, in electricity generation in Ukraine is uh, more than 50 uh, percent. It's mostly the 53 to 55 percent to the last years. And um, design operational time uh, was continued already for uh, 10 uh, to 20 years uh, for uh, 11 power units already. So also in our nuclear sector, we have uh, Chernobyl NPP with uh, their three uh, reactors, Erbenka, um, uh, in the decommissioning uh, and the uh, new safe confinement in operation. Uh, we have uh, fewer research reactors in Kiev and Sevastopol, and we have uh, enterprises uh, for uranium mining, and of course, uh, some enterprises which managed with radioactive waste. So I will more focus my presentation on the nuclear sector with for nuclear power plants, not for other. So our, within the, our legal and regulatory framework, uh, the main national policy principle are established in uh, basic laws, uh, such as law on nuclear energy use and radiation safety, law on radioactive waste management, and uh, law on ratification on uh, convention of nuclear safety, law on licensing in the field of nuclear energy use and other um, legislation. The main principles include the, the very general as the, any international licensing legislation. It includes, uh, consists on priority of safety, radiation protection principles, uh, responsibility allocation, radioactive waste management minimization principle, uh, responsibility for financial and insurance during nuclear energy use, regulatory system, uh, social issues and transparency, public involvement and international cooperation, and also the principle uh, to separate the state regulatory and state management functions. Uh, separate the state management in nuclear energy use and state management in radioactive waste, disposal and long-term storage. And uh, the last separation is separate the activity and responsibility of state authorities and operator. So the um, state management system, it's uh, uh, you can see on this uh, chart, uh, on the top level is the Cabinet of Ministry of Ukraine. Uh, under the uh, government, uh, we have the Ministry of Energy and uh, a new Nuclear uh, Regulatory Inspectorate of Ukraine, which is a regulatory body, and then Ministry of Environmental uh, Protection, which uh, deal with the radioactive waste management sector and Ministry of Energy managed uh, the main operator of nuclear power plants, it's uh, Energoatom, uh, and uh, also managed uh, the enterprises uh, uh, for uranium mining. So the national strategy in the nuclear sector is established in a few uh, uh, legal regulations, such as the main of them, the energy strategy of Ukraine until uh, 2035, either safety, energy efficiency, and uh, competitiveness. It is the name of the strategy. Uh, 
And uh, they also, uh, for spent fuel, we have uh, law on spent fuel management for siting, design, and construction of the centralized spent fuel storage facility for Ukrainian uh, NPP with VVR reactors. Uh, we have concept of state economical program of uh, atomic industry development. Uh, then we have concept of the state economical program of spent uh, nuclear fuel management for Ukrainian NPPs. Uh, we have uh, state uh, ecological program, state uh, Ecolo economical prog ecological program for urgent measures uh, for transformation of former uranium site into the safe uh, state. Then we have radioactive management strategy mm -hmm. and state national program for Chernobyl and PP decommissioning and uh, shelter transforma transformation into environmentally safe system. So it's a main, I think, the national strategy, strategical documents in place. And uh, some of them, uh, they are under development. Uh, for now, we are considering draft of the concept of the long-term safe econ state economical program for nuclear energy development. It's the overall document, which is developed now by the operator, uh, Energoatom. And it's, this document is under review of the Ministry of Energy and also under the expert review. And this document, we hope uh, when it could be legal, legally approved uh, by the government, it could uh, just uh, focus on the long-term strategy for development of nuclear sector in Ukraine. Uh, then we have draft a state economical program of spent nuclear fuel management for Ukrainian NPP up to 2025. And uh, draft of the concept of the state ecological program of radioactive waste management. It is developed by state agency uh, of exclusion zone management, uh, which is their um, my management, the state management uh, uh, authority for radioactive waste management. And also uh, we plan uh, the periodical review and updated uh, the, uh, of the commissioning concept uh, for all operated NPP. Now I will a few words uh, that uh, Oksana already mentioned, uh, the recent order of the President of Ukraine, uh, number 406 from the 20th of September. And according to this order, the issue of the corporatization of um, uh, the state enterprise Energoatom is under consideration by Ministry of Energy. Uh, this account to, to uh, Deloitte company recommendations. And we also consider the issue of enhancing of the state management system for Energoatom and the issue of the feasibility of finishing construction of units uh, three and four of Khmelnytsky NPP. So all these issues are right now under considerations and discussions. Uh, then uh, I would uh, just draw your attention to the sustainable operational safety because uh, the main issue of the nuclear energy use is the safety. Natalia, I just wanted to uh, remind you about keeping the time. Mm -hmm. We are already out of, of the time and so just please few minutes of the, the okay. most key issues. So uh, this uh, uh, operational safety is uh, 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 it is a main document, is comprehensive overall program of uh, safety improvements for Ukrainian NPP power units and uh, with the additional measures according to the stress test results after the Fukushima DHA accident 
and um, the objectives of this uh, comprehensive program are enhance of operational safety level of uh, MPP and uh, to comply them with the national and international regulations, a decrease of accidental risk uh, at MPP due to extreme natural events and uh, disaster, and increase of management efficiency of design and uh, beyond design accidents at NPP and minimization of consequences of such events and to develop conditions for the design operational time continuation for the uh, units. So implementation, uh, results of implementation of this program, uh, they lead to the radiation parameters and characteristics of MVP operation not exceed the current regulations and norm. The radiation protection of operational staff and members of publics complies with the requirements. An MPP operation does not lead to the ecology changes which could influence the environment in the MPP sites regions. And according to the conclusions of uh, uh, International Atomic Energy Agency and European Commission experts, so the safety level of Ukrainian MPP complies with the international strategy, uh, standards and recommendations. Mm, so uh, energy strategy, uh, so then I have a few slides just about the uh, spent fuel management uh, that uh, now we have uh, uh, energy within the energy strategy, we develop uh, um, the centralized uh, spent fuel storage facility for VVR, for spent fuel from VVR reactor. It, it's now under the finishing of construction in the Chernobyl NPP exclusion zone. And currently, uh, before finishing this uh, new facility, the Ukraine implements both the design procedure for say, uh, spent fuel management, which foresee transport of spent fuel uh, from NPP for reprocessing to the Russian Federation, with receiving back the uh, radioactive waste after reprocessing, and uh, also long-term storage on the Zaporizhia NPP site. And one of the MPP in Zaporizhia, we have their own spent fuel dry storage facility. And of course, the MPPs implement a wide range measures for radioactive waste management strategy. They build the design and construction of solid and liquid radioactive waste reprocessing facility to produce packages accepted for disposal. So this uh, wide range, uh, wide range of facilities and technologies which could be applied. It uh, includes retrieval facilities, sorting, fragmentation, compaction, grouting, incineration. So all the general, uh, all general technologies of radioactive waste. So thank you for your attention. It's just a very short overview. Uh, thank you so much, Natalia. I was personally uh, happy to hear that there are such documents like concept of the long-term development uh, for the nuclear sector is under preparing at the moment and that there is a draft decommissioning strategy that is also under development. I really hope that this document would be um, available for the further public discussion very soon because so far uh, there are no consultations happening uh, as far as I know. And also for sure, thank you for mentioning the safety uh, issues because safety first, let's, let's be frank with each other. Safety is the, the most important issue when we speak about the nuclear uh, sector in Ukraine. And here I would like to invite Alexandra Zeika from the Environmental NGO EcoAction to share their position on the uh, nuclear sector in Ukraine. So how do you assess it? Thank you, Oksana. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to join the today's discussion. Um, as a representative of an environmental NGO, I'd like to say that we are very worried about the state of uh, nuclear power in Ukraine. Our main concerns are, first of all, uh, it's artificially lowered price for the nuclear electricity. 
Second is uh, spent nuclear fuel and um, radioactive waste management. Third is uh, dependency on Russia. And the fourth is unrealistic plans of development of the nuclear industry. So I'd like to explain the points I've mentioned. First, the lowered price. Um, it is true that in Ukraine, the tariff for the nuclear electricity is the lowest among other power sources. But it does not mean that nuclear power is cheap. Uh, in Ukraine, the tariff does not cover all costs and negative externalities related to the production of nuclear electricity. Uh, for example, it does not cover the full cost of radioactive waste management and does not cover the cost of spent nuclear fuel management. As well, uh, the money collected to the decommissioning fund are not enough and uh, also they are exposed to the inflation, which does not, uh, it doesn't improve the situation with the fund. Um, the second point is spent nuclear fuel. In Ukraine right now we have only one storage for the spent fuel on the Parisia NPP site. Uh, the fuel from the remain NPPs have to be stored in the central storage that is located in Chernobyl. But right now it's not possible because after a number of uh, construction delays the storage is still not ready to be used. And this leads us to the next point that we are concerned about, and it is a dependency on Russia. While we can't use our storage for spent fuel, uh, we are sending it, um, we are sending our fuel from three other NPPs, except of Zuparisha, uh, for storage and reprocessing to Russia. For this, every year, Ukraine pays around $200 million. Also, 100% of the nuclear fuel used on the our NPPs is imported. About 60% of the fuel we use is still manufactured by the Russian company called Twell. Um, American company called Westinghouse produces their main part. So that means that Ukraine is fully dependent on the other countries when it comes to the nuclear fuel for our power plants. And uh, the last but not least is that Ukraine has unrealistic plans regarding the development of nuclear industry. All over the world, countries begin the phase out of nuclear power. Uh, no new plan, no, no new reactors have been commissioned in the European Union and the United States in the last 10 years, as it's not economically feasible. But um, in August, state-owned nuclear operator Energoatom started to talk about the construction of Unit 3 and 4 of Khmelnytsky NPP. And last month, the president of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, instructed the cabinet of ministers to develop and submit to Verkhovna Rada a bill on design and construction of the units three and four of Khmelnytsky NPP. Um, frankly, this project is a nonsense. Why? Uh, Energatom plans to use old constructions which were not examined for the last 14 years and there is no proof that they are safe to use. As well, there is only two companies in the world who can provide reactors for those units, and they both are Russian. Economically, this project is not feasible. There is no finances for its implementation. So we believe it is more effective to invest money in energy efficiency and the renewables. And those are our concerns about the nuclear industry in Ukraine. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Alexandra, for such a ballot uh, addressing uh, of those challenges we face here in, um, in Ukrainian energy sector towards the nuclear. And uh, continue on this, so, on those concerns that we have, uh, I also would like to uh, ask Mr. Massimo Gariba 
who is deputy director uh, of uh, director general on uh, energy of european commission uh, european union is the let me say the most reliable partner of ukraine at the moment and we really need to appreciate it that is why for us uh, as for Ukrainian society in general, it is very important to know uh, your assessments on uh, what is happening. And uh, especially we are interested to know, uh, for example, those aspects of EU monitoring on progress in safety up upgrades in Ukrainian stations. Uh, does it all you European Union uh, follow financial and technical capacity of Ukraine, for example, for safety up upgrades, for decommissioning of lifetime expired reactors, and so on. And how does this influence European-Ukrainian relations in the energy sector and could influence in future? Thank you, Oksana. All this in seven minutes will be a world record, but I will try to do my best to say, to say a few answers. things. Uh, first of all, let me say that uh, the Ukraine is a strategic partner, partner for, the, for the EU and that we've been uh, gradually uh, working to align energy policy and legislation to the EU. Uh, norms and standards. Uh, Ukraine has an ambitious energy agenda uh, based on the uh, EU association agreement in force since 2017, where there is a, a I would say, large annex uh, with uh, which concerns uh, um, energy altogether. Uh, we also acknowledge that uh, there have been far-reaching reforms uh, in the past years uh, and important structural changes in the, in the energy sectors. So I think that we should encourage altogether the government to keep moving in, uh, in this direction and continue reform towards the creation of a fully functioning and competitive electricity and gas market, which is one of the key uh, prerequisites where you can have you can have a functioning uh, energy system whether it's nuclear or not nuclear doesn't uh, doesn't matter uh, the market is 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 very important to achieve the right conditions now uh, there was a summit um, on the 6th of october uh, where the president of the european council charles michel and the high representative for eu uh, foreign affairs joseph borrell met president zelensky and uh, there was a political impulse to accelerate the efforts which are in the uh, in this annex 17 of the association agreement i think that this sets the overall uh, framework now if we move a little bit towards the subject matter, which is nuclear. Uh, Ukraine has agreed to align its legislation to the European uh, one on nuclear safety, uh, safe management of radioactive waste and spent fuel and radiation protection. We are supporting these legislative efforts also with uh, a number of projects which are financed by our external branch uh, the so-called dg development and cooperation it has changed name last week and i don't know the new name uh, but i think that everybody knows it as uh, dg development and cooperation for uh, for the moment on uh, implementation and transposition of nuclear safety regulation based on the EU experience and the uh, EU acquis. So the target is to have uh, in place a robust Ukrainian regulatory framework based on the highest standards of safety uh, for the autumn of next year. Uh, this is where uh, we are, we are uh, working at. Uh, there should be also a sectoral meeting uh, between, uh, between my commissioner, Ms. Simpson, and uh, the acting minister of energy. And we are working to have that before the end of the year. But as you understand, circumstances at the moment are rather uh, complex. 
In the Euratom field, we have a number of bilateral agreements with, uh, with the Ukraine. We have an overall agreement on uh, nuclear cooperation, but we have also specific agreements on nuclear safety, on uh, development of nuclear fusion, uh, nuclear research and development uh, in um, uh, nuclear research and development, uh, trade in nuclear material, and nuclear fuel cycle services. So all these helps to uh, create the basic conditions to uh, work indeed on the on the alignment of the uh, of the two systems. Since '86, uh, moreover, the Ukraine has been a continuous focus of EU nuclear safety policy following Chernobyl. You are perfectly aware that the EU has heavily invested in uh, trying to mitigate the post uh, Chernobyl consequences in Ukraine and Belarus. The Chernobyl Shelter Fund, which was managed through the BRD, uh, was one of our main contributions, to which we provided 430 uh, million euro. And last year in February, I actually went and visited in, in, in Chernobyl because it had recently been, uh, been completed. Uh, one important thing is that the, the shelter is a, a temporary structure, as you know, designed to last a certain number of years. And therefore, the decommissioning of reactor number four uh, of the Chernobyl site is one of the uh, big commitment which are uh, pending on the uh, Ukrainian uh, government. Beyond this, uh, you are also aware that uh, there has been a number of measures to strengthen uh, nuclear safety in, uh, in the Ukraine. There is a combined 600 million euro loan between uh, the Commission and the uh, EBRD which supports the complex consolidated safety upgrade program developed by Energoatom, uh, which to my knowledge amounts to something like 1.74 billion euros. So we are in the range of a 30% uh, contribution to that. It is a comprehensive program of uh, safety improvements, um, modernization, uh, of monitoring and control equipment, installation of new equipment, and the safety operational measures. Uh, we had some difficulties in disbursing some of this money because of the, uh, I would say, perceived slowness of uh, um, aligning uh, certain parts of the Ukrainian nuclear safety legislation with uh, ours. However, uh, in particular, regarding the effective independence of the uh, nuclear safety reg regulator, but in the spring of this year, uh, the law was passed uh, through the Ukrainian parliament and therefore this issue was resolved and the uh, money was released. Uh, as it was mentioned already, uh, Ukraine uh, also um, fully participated in the uh, post-Fukushima stress test in 2011-2012. Uh, most of the safety measures, uh, uh, let me say, like a European member state, they, they were fully integrated in, in, in the process, and this is contrary to what is happening, for example, in neighboring Belarus today, where we are looking at the Astravets nuclear power plant, but with a very much delayed timetable. The, the stress tests are being completed now in Belarus. So in the Ukraine, they were completed together with, with the rest of the EU in 2012. There are some outstanding uh, safety measures and we, uh, and we um, expect completion uh, by the end of next year. All the material which has to do with the stress test is public, publicly available on the uh, ENSREG um, uh, website, ENSREG.eu. Um, Ukraine also participated to uh, one provision of the uh, the new revised safety directive that followed um, the revision of the post Chernobyl, uh, post Fukushima legislation in 2014, 
we have a so-called topical peer review which takes place uh, every six years. In 2018, we carried out the first one, which was on the um, um, on the aging uh, structures. So it was, I would say, particularly suited to uh, some of the situations that there are in the Ukraine, uh, namely the average age of the fleet, which is around uh, 33 years old. Uh, we are initiating preparation for the second uh, peer review exercise, which will take place in 2022-23, and we very much welcome the uh, participation of the Ukrainian regulators in that. So uh, I think I gave you a little bit, I will stop here. I think I gave you a, a few elements of the type of collaboration that we see uh, developing between us and, and, and the Ukraine. And be reassured that uh, from the EU, we will continue to use all instruments at our disposal, legislative, financial, pressure, let me say, through international organizations and so on to ensure that the highest possible safety levels are achieved when nuclear installations are operated. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gariba, uh, for keeping time in and for your uh, very fruitful uh, and information-based uh, input. We really see that uh, you follow what is happening in Ukraine. Uh, even uh, might be better than some Ukrainian stakeholders. Uh, before passing to the international context on nuclear sector and the Ukraine role in it and the Ukraine situation from the perspective of international circumstances, knowing your very uh, limited time availability, I just wanted to open a few question session to you before you left. Uh, I already see one hand uh, raised, uh, so might be let's already start with this question. So I see a hand from Oleg Savitsky. Uh, hello, um, Oleg Savitsky, board member of uh, NGO EcoAction and uh, also uh, expert of uh, Ukrainian Climate Network. Uh, my question to uh, Mr. Gariba relates uh, to the comprehensive safety upgrade uh, program, uh, which is also funded by Euratom uh, on part with EBRD. And uh, as we know fr from uh, like uh, communications and uh, public documentation that uh, there should be a regular monitoring of this uh, uh, program uh, from uh, the lender uh, perspective and that uh, uh, under the initial conditions of this loan the, there was a, a statement that uh, 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 EBRD and uh, uh, Euratom will uh, use uh, services of a consultant namely the, the so-called lenders uh, monitoring consultant uh, to prepare regular reports uh, so um, are those reports uh, public is the first question and uh, uh, how uh, how many of them already been uh, performed and uh, uh, the second question related to this uh, uh, is uh, is there any indications in those reports of uh, issues which became known nationally this year, uh, namely problems with uh, backup diesel generators. Uh, maybe uh, I'm, I'm sure that you're informed that uh, on 25th September, uh, we had an accident at uh, the Parisian nuclear power plant, uh, ranked as the ENS-1 uh, accident by the state regulator. Uh, when we had a, a uh, malfunction of the diesel generator during the, his uh, test launch and uh, to our knowledge we and we don't have any information on successful tests of uh, diesel generators uh, before that at the Parisia 
uh, nuclear power plant and uh, uh, we as a civil society are very concerned on the safety of this uh, power plant which is uh, the largest in Europe and uh, uh, at least for every uh, six units there should be an operational diesel generators which uh, the, the uh, station has in total 12 and we don't have uh, any information on successful tests of those uh, diesel generators in last 10 years. Okay, so, thank you, Alex. So let's uh, let our panelists to reply. So please, Mr. Gariba. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your, for your very detailed questions. Now, as far as the loan uh, follow-up is concerned, I'm afraid I'm not in a position to tell you all the numbers of the reports and so on. I have not uh, I have not followed these uh, these personally, but what I can tell you is that there are two bodies, the lenders monitoring consultant and the project management unit at the BRD that uh, receive quarterly reports to uh, to from uh, from the ground. So this is something that uh, that it is that it is um, routinely done. And it is done because, uh, indeed, uh, this is needed to closely monitor the loan execution, payment forecast, and schedules, uh, have, as I have tried to, uh, to, to explain uh, before. Now, whether the reports are public, this I uh, have to tell you that I severely doubt because I know how the BRD works. Uh, so I'm not so sure that this is that this is something that uh, that is that is full in the public domain. What I can say is that I can I can inquire and come back to you on that. Um, now, as far as the diesel generators at uh, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, yes, we are uh, fully informed, uh, and thanks to one of the participants, I saw that. Uh, my good colleagues and old friend Jan Averkamp is in the audience. Uh, Jan uh, very timely informed me and informed also uh, the European Club of Nuclear Regulators, ENSREG, on, uh, on, on the situation. And uh, the only thing that I would like to say is that we are uh, looking at these in, uh, in ENSREG and uh, when we have our meeting at the beginning of uh, beginning of November, I think the 10th of November, this is one of the items which will be on the agenda. And so we will have uh, also the official reaction from the, uh, from the European regulators. I think being such a technical matter, it is much more appropriate for them to comment on the status than uh, from a technocrat like me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I see the hand raised, uh, and I remind now that we collect questions only to Mr. Gariba at the moment because he will uh, leave in a few minutes. So if you have just direct question to him, this is a proper time to do it. Uh, if no, we will have a questions and answer session after the uh, last panelist, uh, Mr. Anthony Frogat, will present, uh, deliver his speech. So if, uh, Anna Vera Wendland, if you have direct question to Mr. Gariba, just please do it uh, right now, raise it. Hi to you all. I'm just here at a German nuclear power plant, so I, I can comment on this diesel, uh, emergency diesel question as well. But uh, my question goes to, um, to Massimo, uh, it's another one. Can you give us um, at least one example for, for um, modernization or upgrading um, project um, with Ukrainian nuclear power plants, which is um, uh, co-authored or, um, uh, or enhanced by European Union? Thank you. Thank you, Anna. No, the, the short answer is no. I, I'm, I'm not aware of anything which is actually concluded uh, and, and, and done. Thank you so much. Uh, we still hope uh, uh, to have uh, more questions and un answers in the discussion session. Uh, and now I wanted to uh, invite Mr. Anthony Frogat uh, to put the Ukrainian nuclear sector in the international context. 
So how those processes that are happening in Ukraine rely, uh, correspond to what is happening in the world and especially uh, might be, you can comment on those potential uh, and the uh, perspectives of construction of new uh, units at the Khmelnytsky NPP. So what are those, uh, for example, prices for construction of new units worldwide? So please, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, can you share, see my screen? I'm not sure if you can. Uh, we see it, but not in the full screen mode so far. Um, it's hard, I can't. Um, sorry, give me two seconds. It seems to be, is that better? Yes. Yeah, it's good now. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, so my name is Anthony Froggett. Uh, I'm a senior research fellow at Chatham House and independent of that, um, I work on a project called the World Nuclear Industry Status Report. Uh, and this has been um, underway for a, a couple of decades actually. Uh, and I work with a colleague called Michael Snyder. And the latest version of this was published uh, in September. Uh, and so what I'll do is just present a few slides that give an overview. I mean, it, it's a huge document. Um, the, I, I don't know how many pages, a few hundred pages, uh, and the, the, it can be seen, um, you'll see the web link uh, at the end. Uh, but just, uh, I, I guess the first thing, which most people are aware of, but the, the extent of it, I, I think is, is under, uh, un, under understood. No, it's a misunderstood. Is, is the, on, in the blue here, we have the reactor startups around the world. And you can see basically that going up through until the sort of mid 1980s. And there was, uh, this has primarily been affected by a, a number of things. Uh, firstly, uh, nuclear accidents. So you can see uh, in the, uh, I don't know if, you, if I show my mouse, I hope you, can you see my mouse? Yeah, so th this is in, uh, 1979. So you can see there a, a decrease in, in reactor startups. And that was primarily res, as a result of uh, the Three Mile accident, Three Mile Island accident uh, in the United States. And then you can see it, that the sort of the peak of the curve is in 1985, 1986. And so that was really as a result of Chernobyl, you saw a, a, a slowdown uh, in reactor startups. There was uh, Obviously, people were concerned about safety, so some were delayed. But also, then the the, the real decline, the, the, which to which the, the industry has never really recovered in, in terms of uh, reactor new uh, startups, and, and and that sort of goes on now uh, over the last couple of decades. And below the line is is the reactor closures, and you can see that some of this historically is just old reactors that didn't work very well, and then you saw peaks here in in sort of 1990. Uh, which was then the closure of reactors uh, as a result of the, in large, um, the unification of Germany. Uh, and then other ones here in, in 2011, which is the Fukushima event. So uh, a, an overall clear trend. Uh, and what we've seen most recently is uh, in terms of 2020 is the closure of uh, a number of reactors. So, so far this year, three reactors have closed and the startup of a couple. Uh, and in this case, it was in uh, in the United Arab Emirates. So that was the first time that's a, that a, a sort of new country, a country that hasn't had nuclear power before, has started up reactors for a couple of decades, and then one more in China. And China, as in all things in the energy sector, dominates uh, in terms of the numbers. Just in terms of uh, the EU, I, I guess a similar pattern. We've talked about the, the impact of Chernobyl and, and the closure here, or, or the, the slowdown of orders. Uh, here we have, I mentioned this in terms of unification of Germany. And here we can see the last three reactors being ordered uh, or, or started startups in, in Europe. So Temelin is in the Czech Republic and Chernovoda is in Romania. And so, yeah, over the last couple of decades, really no new startups and, and lots of closures. And this is for a combination of reasons. This closures is, is partly political. Um, so, for example, in Germany, you have a, a phase out decision that was reintroduced uh, following Fukushima. 
that will see the closure of all of the reactors uh, sometime next decade, so within the next five years. And some of them are just industrial decisions, just reactors are coming to the end of their operating lives, like in the UK, you see all of the oldest reactors are designed, the Magnox reactors are now closed, uh, and similar reactor closures in uh, Sweden, etc. So in terms of going forward, um, I, I guess the most one of the key issues for the industry is, is are they building more reactors? Uh, and so we can see here in terms of number of units, we have around 50 reactors around the world that are being built. Uh, in terms of capacity, this is around 53 gigawatts. So really rather small uh, compared to the sort of the global nuclear fleet that's around 400 and something. Uh, and very small in, in terms of the, the overall uh, capacity of, of the power grids around the world and is dominated by a, a, a small number of countries. Um, and in, in basically, I would say that there is only China, India, South Korea and Russia that have reactors being built in more than one site. So I, I would argue that all of the others, basically, you don't have a, a active program you, you have a, a construction at a site. But China obviously dominates, as I mentioned, it dominates most things within the power sector. It has 15 units uh, out of 52, but this is really a slowdown. Um, and again, it was affected by Fukushima in terms of the reactors that it was ordering. Um, so reactor orders a handful of countries. Um, and why is that? Uh, and I think probably this is one of the most important slides to think about. So, so this is uh, taken from, Lazard, which is a, a consultant company in the United States, and they do this every year. Uh, and what they're doing is, is looking at the, the levelized cost of electricity. So this LCOE, which is what it's talking about is, is what is the production costs of electricity in the United States from all of these different uh, electricity generating sources. And here we see solar, which started off uh, 10 years ago, producing power at around $350 a megawatt hour, down to debt today to below 50. Uh, likewise, you have wind here, which is from around 135 down to around 40. And you have nuclear, uh, which is this, uh, this purple one here, that is going from around $123 uh, dollars a megawatt hour to 155. You mean costs? So, so this is the levelized cost of electricity. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so yeah, it's it, it's very clear we have different trends, and and this is trends that we're seeing all over the world uh, that the costs of renewable energy is falling, uh, while the costs of nuclear is at best ecstatic, but in many cases it, it's going up, and and this is the decision, uh, the Mr. Uh, Massimo was, Massimo was talking about the, the desire in Ukraine for the, the introduction of a uh, electricity market. And if you have a, a free electricity market, then the market will choose probably the, the cheapest source. And here we have see what the cheapest source is in, in uh, the United States. But as I said, this is representative of uh, many countries around the world. Clearly, there are other questions. It's not just about the, the actual generating costs of electricity. It's also about how you, what's the cost to the overall system. And I, I, I'm sure that we'll come into this in the discussion uh, in terms of the, the, the need for flexibility within the, within the systems. Uh, but it, this really is the, the key picture in terms of which are now the cheaper generating sources. And my final slide, because I, I need to finish up, is just to say, this is the, his, the, the global investment in, in nuclear power versus renewables, again, over the last 15 years or so. Uh, and what we see here in, in the line, in purple along the bottom, is the invest, when investments were weighed in nuclear power uh, and how much they were, versus the investments per year that was, were made in renewable energies. And, and the key thing here is, is that on the global level, uh, investments are about an order of magnitude larger uh, between renewables uh, and nuclear power. And what that means is that as there is more investments, then what we've seen is that the costs of, of renewables continue to fall. As you have learning curves, you have greater deployment levels, uh, while you have very little investment in nuclear power and you don't see the same economies of scale. And so one would expect that the, the trends that we saw in the previous graph 
uh, will continue, if not accelerate, um, on the global level. So in, in terms of as countries need, seek to and need to decarbonize rapidly and cheaply, then I would argue that probably the, what we're increasingly seeing is, is that renewables, solar and wind are the cheapest option. And they are cheaper than not only nuclear, but increasingly of, of fossil fuels uh, such as coal uh, and gas as well. So I think that is the choice facing uh, energy electricity planners around the world. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mr. Frogat. And uh, yep, what we see now is uh, also coinciding with uh, what we uh, heard from uh, Mr. Massimo Gariba, uh, who has left because of his other responsibilities, but we are very uh, thankful to him for his participation. If the power market is fully functioning, then those economic reasons, they influence what uh, future developments in energy sector we will see. And if levelized cost of electricity production is lower for renewables, then it's clear where investments will go. And this is what is happening in the world. So thank you for addressing this. And we uh, can open the questions and answer session at the moment that I see already some hands uh, raised and um, questions posted in chat and uh, you also can do it. You can raise your hand or post your question in chat. And what I would like to start with uh, is the particular, the question from the uh, Birgit Wetzel. Because this question, I think, is really one we are all interested to know the reply on. What are plans for the future energy landscape in Ukraine? Do we, as a country, know where we are going with the nuclear sector? Do we want to keep those nuclear units for, for, a, for an, an eternal time? Uh, I'm not sure uh, uh, who from today's panelists can give a precise uh, answer for this question, but I would like to address it to uh, Natalia Rebalta, representative of the Ministry of Energy. So what are the overall plan? For example, do you know what is uh, written on that concept of the long-term development uh, strategy for the nuclear sector? for how long Ukraine is going to, reply, to rely on nuclear? And is it about existing nuclear uh, power uh, plants and those units or construction, for example, of the new ones? So <clears throat> the, we have, I think that uh, Ukraine have no alternative decision. Ukraine should use nuclear energy any other source of energy, electricity, can't replace the nuclear for now. And I think that this situation would remain for, for a long time in future. So that's the main reason for developing this long-term strategy is considering the future because now the situation is more or less clear because until 2035 we would have uh, reactors uh, remaining reactors uh, still operated and uh, the reactors which were continued their lifetimes they also would be operated but after the uh, 2035 it would be the time when um, the lifetime of the major amount of operated reactors would be extended and then we could think about uh, renew the um, the power of uh, uh, nuclear energy so this uh, construction of uh, new uh, technologically maybe new units it should be in this uh, strategy this should be either the big uh, uh, units <laughs> or it should be smaller and then now it's considering the uh, small modular reactors and uh, it's uh, very now also Ukraine is um, 
join this uh, field and this uh, signed memorandum with uh, I think some partners international uh, to study this issue the possibility especially for example for Rona MPP when they have no too much uh, um, power in the nuclear power plant so they could be easily exchanged with the fewer for example um, such uh, small reactors but uh, this all issues of more deep expert analysis so I could not give now the some particular and straight prognosis and they I don't have them because nobody have know them and but I, when this document would be I don't just put in uh, when the ministry would consider it and uh, by itself uh, started to, uh, to make it uh, legal in this process this document would be made public I think uh, as a usual procedure of public involvement uh, for discussing on any draft of uh, some uh, legal document or strategy. And I think this uh, any public uh, could be involved and all interested parties uh, could influence and could make the proposals uh, to this uh, strategy. But I think that the, we should, uh, we have no other choice. We should remain our energy just we see here today from European expert and thanks him very much from Massimo and through to, he told that Ukrainian NPP absolutely uh, they prove the safety on the all international levels and they continue to do so and they make efforts developing regulations making the comprehensive program for safety improvement and uh, this all is very open to all international community and so that up to now we have uh, no other choice because uh, uh, nuclear electricity is uh, most remain the most cheap on the market and uh, just the problem that uh, uh, the nuclear market should be put in more let's say honest position on the market because uh, they have no very uh, in good position on this market because they should pay also for renewable energy they should pay for uh, this so I don't know what is some public uh, social uh, obligations. They, yes, yes, they have some social obligations, and uh, so that because we should understand that nuclear itself, they put their own. Yeah, we see those inequalities on the power market. First, to management. Second, to decommissioning. Uh, said to uranium uh, said, uh, mining. So they have their own branches to spend money for and if we yep. would have take this money for some obligations or for some renewable energy then the price of electricity from the nuclear will go up and it will yes the price will go lowest up. Uh, and the cheapest one and yes then we Natalia, should first of all think about the safety three issues. more questions at least and i see those hands uh, rise so i would like to uh, give them um, floor as well and thank you for mentioning uh, these uh, plans and positions. And I just want to remind everyone on that Ukraine um, has prepared the draft concept of energy transition till 2050. It has not been uh, approved and uh, it is on hold, speaking uh, frankly so far. No one knows uh, what will be the destiny of that document. But for example, in that document, it was written that the um, nuclear uh, will uh, have a portion of up to 25 percent in power in uh, 2050 so anyhow even at that strategic level there were talks about uh, some uh, shortening of the portion of nuclear in the total power sector but as i just said this document was not approved so far I see at least two hands raised now, and I would like to give a flow now to Mr. Matti Anelis, 
Uh, so I will ask you yet to switch on your camera and to address your issue. Thank you, um, Oksana. Th it created our interesting discussion. Um, I'm from the Center for Liberal Modernity, Berlin-based think tank. I have two interconnected questions, but uh, first we, uh, we recently had a discussion with Irina Stavchuk, the uh, Vice Energy Ecologic ecology minister, not energy minister. Uh, and uh, we were talking about required investment into nuclear. And uh, we today heard that the most of the nuclear power plants are nearing their um, lifetime by 2035. So would it be possible to attach price tax for the um, approximate price tax for the modernization that is required then? Because um, bec then you will have to face a uh, political decision. Um, and, and weigh the, the uh, in, in required investment versus the alternatives, right? So this would be my first question. And the second question, probably directed to Alexandra, is the, the um, opinion. Uh, Germans are always struck by Ukrainian uh, public opinion or polling when it comes to nuclear. So, uh, and I haven't seen the more recent data, but maybe you can elaborate the, um, the changes in the political perception or aren't there any changes vis-a-vis -vis is Ukrainian pu um, public getting more critical of, nucle of nuclear or uh, more supportive of, of green technology. So maybe you can briefly uh, um, update us on that front too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as any of our speakers would like to address the first uh, question, I saw Mr. Anthony Frogat was just shaving, waving with his hand. Yeah, happy to come in. Um, but I guess the, it's a question of economics, isn't it? In, in terms of what uh, was being talked about was, I think there's the question about the economics of new build versus the economics of uh, life extending. And it's very clear that life extending a reactor is far cheaper than building a new one. Uh, and uh, in theory, also if you're life extending, some of the decommissioning costs have already been taken away, et cetera. So, I mean, firstly, in terms of new build, I don't think anyone is really arguing that if we had an, a, a competitive, competitive tender system, that nuclear power would be cheaper than renewables, in particular uh, wind. I mean, just to give an example, in terms of the UK, um, offshore wind, which is a, a far more expensive uh, form of renewables than onshore wind. When they first started the, or, or when they first signed the contract for the Hinkley, Hinkley Point C, which is the most, the newest reactor in the UK that's being built, uh, the cost of onshore wind was 120 pounds, so around 130, 140 euros a megawatt hour. In the latest round of bidding that was last year, it was at 40 euros a megawatt hour. The fixed price for nuclear that was, that was agreed during, during the process to, to agree to build Hinkley Point C is 90, 90 pounds a megawatt hour. So already looking forward when this is built, if it's built uh, and completed in about five years time, then nuclear power would be probably around twice as expensive as renewable energy. And the UK prides itself as being a, a competitive market. So I think in terms of new build that, yeah, a, a, any rational economist will say that, that nuclear is, is more expensive. In terms of life extension, I think it's more difficult. Uh, but again, as we start to see the costs of renewables falling, we also have to look at the cost of keeping reactors operating. And as you get older, as, as we know with anything, cars, uh, televisions, etc., there's a certain life in which it's relatively cheap to operate these these the, the equipment because they all have their own operating life but as they get older the repairs cost more etc cetera, etc cetera. so um, various studies in particular in the united states have shown that nuclear uh, is life extensions of nuclear are more expensive than building new uh, renewable that may not be the case everywhere but i think that is the trend that we will increasingly see so i i, I do think you one would look to renewables both in terms of independence from any country, but I, I, it was talked about in some of the previous presentations in terms of the importance of being independent from Russia. You don't have fuel dependency, you don't have waste management dependency if you build renewables. Uh, you have, as I mentioned, in terms of the economics, 
But also maybe, sorry, just the final point is just to think about Ukraine as a strategic, a strategic opportunity. Ukraine, ha Ukraine has very large land mass. Uh, and in terms of renewables, being able to look for importing electricity into the EU and making profits, then this is surely an opportunity that one would look at as, as a strategic resource that Ukraine and other countries can have to become the powerhouse of, of the European markets. And so, yeah, I would really look at it in that regard. In some ways, we see that already with the Power Bridge project. Uh, which is looking at importing electricity from nuclear power plants. Maybe there's an opportunity for Ukraine to generate significant income by importing renewably generated electricity. Thank you. Thank you so much. And yep, it is uh, very, um, let, let's say, unresearched uh, so far, how much it will cost for us future uh, additional life extension of already 10 and 20 years life extended units and how uh, that electricity uh, will cost uh, in future. And now I would like to invite uh, Alexander to comment on the second question on public uh, opinion. Thank you. Um, last year, a collection together with the Friedrich Ebert uh, um, Fund conducted a social survey uh, regarding in the attitude of people towards renewables, energy efficiency, and uh, nuclear power also. And uh, what I can say, um, comparing to the um, results of the survey we con conducted in 2017, I remember, so two years before, um, people became um, uh, more positive about the renewables. And uh, we face the opposite situation with nuclear people. Um, people don't believe in uh, nuclear so much anymore. So that's that's the attitude uh, that we saw from the from our survey. Thank you so much, uh, Alexandra. Uh, so now let's go uh, again to Anna Verov. I see your hand. Uh, uh, just please switch on your camera and um, address your question. Yes, um, uh, I would address a short question or comment, or rather a comment to Anthony. Of course, renewables are really uh, the most expensive, of course, in, uh, uh, if you regard these levelized costs of electricity. But um, you should consider anyway, if you want to build a perspective for Ukraine, building an energy system on variable renewables, that um, variable uh, renewables as wind and solar do not go without system costs, of course, with uh, very high system costs. So it is, um, it is precisely these costs which um, determine the cost of a renewable energy system. And uh, so you, you should anyway include the costs of the backup or of the um of the um electricity storage infrastructure which has to be um be available for these uh, variable renewables as well so the system goes much more expensive as the simple um, levelized costs of electricity and do not forget even um, if you discuss uh, such a system for ukraine please keep in mind that in germany we got to this level of uh, you know of success of renewable energies with large enhancement projects with, which costs about 30 billion euros a year so uh, which which is um, covered by the electricity cost itself but by subsidies as well so if you want really to create a holistic picture of what does such an energy system cost, I would like to have a little bit more, I would say a less enthusiastic picture of, a, of the renewables. Um, I think that would be a little bit more honest uh, when um, giving Ukraine a perspective uh, um, on, on, on this issue. I, personally, I think the Ukrainian, um, the Ukrainian plan to build uh, decarbonization on a on a trunk of 25% uh, of nuclear plus renewables, it seems to me uh, uh, very, very rational because uh, uh, in a way it may it may um, resolve this issue of um, backup for variable renewables. But I I agree with you that Ukraine has a really a, a large potential for renewables. Of course, I would agree in this point. Of course. 
Thank you so much. Um, and do we have uh, a comment on, um, on your comment from Alexei Pasuk in chat on that 50% of nuclear in Ukraine uh, now requires stores, uh, storage because of uh, night overcapacity? And uh, using this opportunity, uh, I would uh, stress now that everything needs really very big evidence base uh, and we need research on how much and what type of power costs were. And here we as the foundation, as Heinrich Dolph Foundation, uh, are going to implement a research on how much uh, and how feasible uh, system and the different um, type of electricity uh, will cost till 2030 uh, if we, for example, phase out coal. So, but what I would like to really stress on now that every estimations we uh, do they really need very big evidence for a particular country and for sure for ukraine there should be more research done on uh, on costs and i see uh, the hand from uh, mr jan Havrikam. so please uh, go ahead i just wanted to to link into that very shortly um the the comparison of course lcoe is only one instrument here um, but I'm, I'm a bit surprised to hear the word system costs in the last month suddenly appearing from every corner where anybody from the nuclear sector is opening his or her mouth. Um, obviously, there is a new trend within the nuclear industry now to, to push that as a new argument to make renewables look more expensive. The, the, the reality is that renewable prices continue to go lower and that uh, nuclear costs are continuing to rise. Having said that, if I look at, at, at the Ukrainian situation, we are looking to a country that does need to invest a lot in its national grid. Uh, the Ukrainian national grid has, at this moment, is, is, is well, let's say it challenging. Um, we have seen a lot of investments made in the last few years, but they have all been oriented on um, a centralized system based on centralized nuclear production um, but the large bulk of investment in the grid still has to come and we need to take very urgently a decision on whether Ukraine wants to continue to centralize and running the risk with that to price itself out of the international electricity market and of course also out of the international competitiveness of um, energy in, uh, intensive industries or whether it will follow a more decentralized system with the opportunity to lower its cost overall. For that, we need to make scenario comparisons. They have not been made properly for Ukraine. Um, there are a few scenario scenarios worked out for Ukraine in the past, but they are at this moment already uh, old and, and, and overtaken by the realities on the ground. Um, if we, if we look at the, if, at the German uh, example, um, stating that uh, the renewable sector has received a lot of subsidies is re, uh, and, and still that there is money going into it, um, does, not, does not really reflect the reality of lowering costs and the fact that new projects in the renewable sector in Germany and in the rest of Europe are at this moment made without subsidies. Um, and it also does not reflect the incredible amount of subsidies that have gone into the nuclear sector historically and that the, histo the nuclear sector at this moment still is profiting from. Um, if I take everything together, I think that this is a very important discussion for Ukraine on this very moment. Ukraine needs to take a direction and then looking at Melnitsky three and four, um, I would say is, is, is being diverted from what really needs to happen. Kmelinski 3 and 4 are in an abominable state, the, the concrete which is already standing. If any construction is going to happen there, it will be one of the more expensive sites because of the site work that needs to be redone. Um, the, the site work that is already in place will not allow for, uh, for more modern uh, designs, which means we we will have to focus on um, generation two reactors 
that cannot be brought up, in, up to a level of, of acceptable risk uh, without incredible investments. Um, I think that the discussion on a future direction is extremely opportune for Ukraine today and not something for, nine, uh, for 2035. Um, we see, we, we have just discussed uh, the situation at the Zaporozhye nuclear power station, a nuclear power station that has received a lifetime extension, although without, or let's say with a very bare bone uh, assessment for the future. Um, but if Zaporozhye has problems with its, uh, with its diesel generators, then we're facing a very dangerous situation at this moment that will lead to enormous costs coming up. Um, it is not a discussion for 2035. It's a discussion for today, uh, the direction that we need to take for Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan, so much. And yes, uh, that's why we are here to discuss now what we, what we can do. Uh, I really happy to see the whole discussion that is uh, now at the moment, but I really want to avoid that uh, this is discussion between few people. So I would like to proceed a bit further and thank you, Jan, for mentioning the third and fourth uh, units of uh, potential, um, potentially new units at Khmelnytsky nuclear station. We have just a few minutes left for our today's uh, event. And I wanted to uh, be sure that uh, we have discussed everything that uh, we wanted uh, at the moment. Uh, and if uh, anyone would like to, to comment uh, um, yeah, on the third and fourth books, just Alexandra texted me that she would like to, to do so. Yes, I wanted uh, to add um, on the community three and four. Um, in my opinion, this process, um, is not made really to build those units, uh, but to get and um, use money for the construction of them and um, to create an image that something is done in the nuclear field, that there is some uh, way um, for the nuclear, for, for the nuclear, for, for, I'm sorry, for the nuclear to still be alive on the Ukrainian market. But, Really, I personally don't believe that uh, this project will be ever completed. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Alexandra, for your comment. Uh, we are uh, at the um, time uh, of almost 90 minutes past from the beginning of our today's event. So at this moment, I would like uh, to stop the discussion, uh, but we for sure would be happy to stay with all of you in touch. And we will share the recording of uh, today's event uh, with all of you, as well as uh, presentations of our panelists. I, thank, uh, I would like to tell, uh, thank you to everyone who has participated uh, with us today and especially for our uh, prominent panelists for their very valuable input. Also, I would like to remind all of you that there is uh, a short survey form to receive uh, a feedback from you uh, on the um, event organization. And as uh, we are uh, organizing such events on a regular base, uh, and this was our the third one, that's why we would like to know your opinion and to uh, adjust uh, on your demand our future events. So thank you everyone. Uh, and I would like to, to pass a word to Robert for, for the last uh, closing remark. Uh, well, thank you, Oksana, and thank uh, big thanks to uh, all our speakers. Uh, I think it was a very interesting discussion. Uh, actually, I, I don't have particular closing remarks. I, I think it would be uh, an impossible task now to summarize it. Um, I, I just uh, uh, subscribe to the uh, closing remarks that you already made. Uh, 
And uh, yeah, we'll uh, be in touch with everyone on the next round of this uh, uh, European Ukrainian roundtable. Um, thanks for being with us this afternoon or evening. And um, yeah, see you next time, hopefully. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.